Welcome, everyone, to another Voices with Verveki. This is part two of an ongoing series I'm having with my uh, dear friend, uh, Jordan Hall. Uh, Jordan has uh, converted uh, to Christianity, and that has been, in some ways, the pivot point, not the only topic of discussion, but it has been the pivot point of a lot of discussion. Uh, last time, he and I, I think, really came into what I think is properly dialogos. There was a reciprocal opening. There was a mutual vulnerability. There was a flexibility of discussion, an openness to emerging intelligibility. Um, and there was both continuity with our past selves and um, promise of new directions. And um, I was very, this is the inadequate verb. I want to say something like please, but that makes it sound too egocentric. I was uh, maybe joyful about what happened last time. Um, not in the sense that I was running around the house kicking up my heel, but in the sense of that felt very deeply right, uh, very deeply good. And I was, um, in, I think, a virtuous sense, proud to be part of it. Um, and so I'm welcoming Jordan back. We're going to pick it up. We have some leftover themes from last time that we're going to start with. Um, uh, we wanted to move to the more uh, macro, the meta level, and talk about uh, where Jordan stands with respect to um, his orientation and his identity uh, uh, towards the, the meta crisis. And, and then related to that is that Jordan brought up the notion of a fellowship of spirit that he's been uh, partaking in. And then around that, I wanted to bring up an issue that needs, I think, a deeper uh, dialogical discussion, which is uh, humility and what it is and how to properly understand it as a virtue. We, and um, I hope you get mutual exploration around that. So first of all, I just want to uh, welcome you, my friend, and thank you again for our last uh, conversation, which I think genuinely became Dialogos. I think the Logos landed, showed up, and carried us both along. But it's great to see you again. Very great to see you again. Yeah. Yeah. I, I noticed that there's a, um, how's it work? So a Dialogos has that feeling of a live performance. I mean this in the musical sense. And unrehearsed. Yeah. Unrehearsed yeah, yeah. and unrehearsable live performance, but also where the invitation and the necessity is to like to, to bring your bring your A game, um, and so it always has this beginning part of like, whoa, are we gonna be able to pull this off? Because you, know, you brought your A game, I I was slacking, but you brought enough to carry us both. And no, uh, that's not true. But okay, and of course, <laughs> therefore, it's, therefore, it's intense. Like, whoa, okay, and then the ability to integrate that, to like bring that into this category of dialogos. And for me, it's always such a beautiful journey. Um, and so <laughs> I get the feeling we're going to have a similar, similar ride this time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm looking forward to this a lot. And uh, I really, I really, um, I really, I aspire to carry the, mem the living momentum of the good faith we had last into this. Um, so uh, I want to talk, uh, bring up the meta crisis. You, you have been talking about it in other places. I, uh, I'm having trouble keeping up with all of your conversations. I have the one that you had with Brendan down, um, and there was some provocative subtitles in there that I, I, I might to, I might refer to. I haven't watched it, so I might be speaking out of ignorance. So I will to endeavor to speak from my concern. And maybe I'll start there. Um, and again, I don't want to debate you. I, I want to do what we've done what we're doing and continue to do. So I'll express a concern I have about uh, addressing the meta crisis. And there's areas I know where we already overlap. And I'm wondering if there's areas of difference and if there's a possible convergence from those differences. It goes along the following lines that um, I think the what is needed to address the meeting crisis is a profoundly metaphysical in the non pejorative sense of that term and that our way in which not not just how we think about our ontology, but how we live our ontology has to undergo a fundamental uh, restructuring. And some of those go around, uh, you know, I know the things we share, pillars, I think profoundly brilliant critique of substance metaphysics. And then the, 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 my adjoining critique of what I call the monadic mind, um, and, 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 and things like that. Um, and I, I think that's important, but my concern is, and 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 so I'm I'm appealing to that as common ground. My concern is that part of the rehabilitation 
Oh, I want to. I want to want a different word. I want to bring in life, like almost revivication, or <laughs> I don't want to use resurrection because that may sound sacrilegious, and I don't mean it to be. Um, of a proper ontology, because you did talk about this deep reconciliation, calling people to home, and part of the proposal of the metaphysic uh, of the meaning crisis is we do not have a cosmic home, given our certain worldview. Now, for me, part of that problematic, and I'm getting to my concern. Part of my problematic is that. Our worldview is, like it or not, and especially at the lived level of our engagement with technology and huge global forces, is a scientific worldview. It is deeply enmeshed. Um, and that the problem with that is, I take it that that scientific worldview is not disposable. We can't uh, get rid of it. Um, but it also is inadequate for giving us um, a way of practicing the cultivation of wisdom and religio. That's one of the core arguments. Uh, and I have generally rejected attempts to go sort of pre-scientific as a solution to that. Um, now, I'm speaking again from my perspective. The Christianity that I was exposed to and have been a lot exposed to, um, I think it is fair to say that it had that toxic nostalgia of wanting to get back to a pre-scientific worldview, which I think is, um, I think it just leads you into a life of com continual performative contradiction um, while, uh, while almost verging because of sort of undercurrents of anxiety on being a hypocrite. Um, and so that brings up the, 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 the issue for me of um, what has passed under the label of naturalism, which of course was the provocative point. And again, I am ignorant of your conversation with Brendan. Uh, so just put, uh, I, I'm asking for charity on your part. And as you know, I am, because of the critique I just made myself and a mutual friend, Greg Enriquez, where we are very critical of what is known as standard naturalism. The idea that all, the, all that you can include in your ontology is what is derivable from your sciences. And we say that's uh, grotesquely inadequate. My good friend, Evan Thompson, has a new book out with a theoretical physicist and an astro astrophysicist called The Blind Spot about how the scientific worldview leaves out uh, a lot. I am going to take a moment here of doing ruthless self-promotion. Uh, In the, When he gets to the chapter on The Blind Spot on cognition, he says the main blind spot is around this issue called relevance realization and he cites one john verveke and um things like that so um i i just a shadow i'm going to be talking with evan about this so the point is there are many people many people i think of excellent competence and provenance who think the current scientific worldview is in some sense radically inadequate and in that sense standard naturalism is a failure and then um Greg and I have proposed a two-step move. The first move is, well, what you're talking about isn't reduction. You're talking about consistency with naturalism, because uh, reductionism fails for a host of reasons. That consistency is not just consistency with what's implied by the scientific uh, worldview, but what is presupposed by it. And that, of course, gets you into a kind of uh, neoplatonic reflection on things like intelligibility uh, and whatnot. And then that extended naturalism can actually afford um, transcendent naturalism if you return to the idea of non-propositional kinds of knowing, knowing in which religio plays a, a proper role. We can enter into religio with these, I, this metaphor is the metaphor we use, it's inadequate in some ways, but with sort of higher levels of reality, deeper levels of reality, and that can be transformative for us. And therefore, the transcendence afforded is not merely psychological hygiene or well-being. It is it has real epistemological and ontological consequences of, of, of import. And we have transcendent naturalism. And then part of that is the idea of trying to propose a way in which we respect the accomplishments of science. I am a scientist while also opening up a really important space that uh, for significant revision of that framework so it can incorporate human spirituality and, dare I say it, religious life. So that is 
the proposal that I have done and that Greg has been a big help. And of course, and I'm not saddling you with anything to say this, I'm just giving credit. You helped significantly along the way. You had conversations with me and Greg uh, about that. You showed up on uh, Transcendent Naturalism for a couple of really important episodes. So I know you're all aware of this and you've actually participated in it in a good faith way. So I think it's fair and you understand I am not I am not framing this as debate. I'm trying to get something going here between us. Um, where you would like to land on that or where you want to take off from it or where you want to push back on it, I'm ready to listen and to hear. Let's see what's the what's where's a place that we can get just like we can get in. Hmm. Okay, so we're invoking the notion of dialogos. And we're we're invoking a a sensibility whereby that notion is meaningful. It has an ontological reality to it. Um, I hope so. <laughs> and there's, there's an implication to the to the concept of identity and relationality. Yeah, we have something like maybe three qualities of relationality. So let's start with the easiest one. But we've you several times said you don't want to do right? so debate. So in debate, we have this relationship where I have an identity, you have an identity. And our identities are effectively fortressed. Right? And what we're doing yes. is sort of flinging propositions back and forth between the identities. And at its best, it fortifies our fortresses. And we, we sort of, like fencers, yeah. you get better at fencing, something like that. Um, yeah, you know? and we use that language. We take our positions and we defend them and you, you undermine mine or I might undermine yours. And it's all, it's this language of siege warfare. Yes. Yep. I get that. Okay. So now I'm going to do a second one. D logos is going to be the third. Uh, the second one is, is dialogue. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm even playing with this similarity, which is, of course, part of the, even part of the confusion that people have because you, know, you spell it like what's the s doing at the end how's that changing it <laughs> um but by dialogue i mean a trade relationship so we're no longer conquer relationship kill or be killed which is debate but now a trade relationship so my my st I still have my fortress you have your fortress but we're trading things back and forth it's a little bit friendlier and um, there's a value like i need to have the the uh the wall that we call it the Drawbridge has to be down. The portcullis has to be up so the wagons can go back and forth. <laughs> um, but, beautiful. But our identities are, are staying what they are. Yeah. In fact, in some sense, even more so because I'm riffing a bit here, but in a trade relationship, there's the whole Ricardian thing. The more specialized I am, the more there's value in what I have to trade. Um, and, and this forms a particular kind of thing, which Forrest Landry actually called type two coherence, uh, or we could call it uh, coordination or economic coordination. There's a there's a, a flat novel ontology, which is the synergy value, and I mean this in the economic sense, of the trades that happen between. But but, but the identity does not emerge to create a uh, a higher dimension. It doesn't go all it doesn't go vertical. It's still happening in the XY plane. Then there's dialogos. Right? In dialogos, the walls are down. The identities are now becoming fluid. Because there's a third, a third, right? We're now in the realm of pure relationality, where we identify ourselves as a relata and we recenter ourselves in the relationship, recognizing that the relationship is more fundamental. Excellent. Um, and we're collaborating now in a space orienting towards that relationship and allowing that relationship to be what we are in service to, um, which is, by the way, ontologically um, greater than us. We are, we are the we are elements and it is something that is a union or, or something that contains and holds those elements in a certain way, of course. Um, so let me just say that was beautiful. That was beautiful. And you can count on my commitment to that. Um, um, I may, of course, fall prey to human uh, fallibility. But what I can say is uh, with my utmost, that is my deepest aspiration, mm. of course, is to come into Dialogos as, and be a vehicle for it. I like that language as much as I possibly can. So um, I want you to count on me to be committed to that. And wherever that might take me, I am willing to follow it. That is how I'm a, that is how I'm a follower of Socrates. There I will go. follow the Logos where it goes. Wow. So th that's, the, that's the scene in my mind as a kid watching the... Uh... The acrobats on the on the trapeze, 
you know, where she's, she's flung and she's just like flying through the air. And, and as it turns out, the other guy was right there at the right time to catch her. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and I believe you. I don't believe you. Actually, there's something deeper than that. Like, I know. So, all right. So in the, in the conversation with Brendan, I, I don't know exactly what, how he organized or categorized things, but there was a particular location, which may or may not have been the one that you were referring to. Where what I was trying to do is I was trying to tease out a sense that I have that the, the scientific worldview, and I'm going to articulate what I mean by that in a moment because I have to Please. make some room for, for, for breaking that up. It, it underlies the form of Christianity that you have stepped away from. It's, it's actually a double move. So what, what some, something happened, I'm proposing, I'm arguing both historically as well as epistemologically, whereby the scientific worldview ultimately was able to conquer the soul of everyone in the West. And then the minds of people who wanted to continue to be Christians recapitulated Christianity on top of the substrate of the scientific worldview. And those who didn't want to be Christians just operated in the, as in a scientific, materialist, you know, humanistic environment. But both were sitting on the scientific worldview. I, I agree with that. I think that is correct. And, and the proposition then I would, I would make is that this is um, the kind of Christianity that shows up in that way is, is just an error. It's just a mistake um, because it's cut its own legs out from underneath it. And, and I think... I think that very close to the heart of that worldview, and yeah, I'm going to be for Vakian level of care here. Um, Thank you for that compliment. Yeah. Um, I, I want to situate that worldview. I want to honor that worldview. This is not uh, a rebuke, except to the degree which is maybe overstepping its proper location. And so the question is, where does it belong? So the scientific worldview, where does it belong? And there's a little bit of a McGill Christian sensibility that's going to come in. Sure, sure. All right. So the third person situation, which is an intrinsic, it's a journalistic relationship with reality. Uh, you have to be by, by its very essence, right? The scientific worldview requires that you step away from the experiment. You observe the experiment as an objective fact, and then you coordinate with other potential subjects on an increasing precision of your ability to articulate facts about those objective facts about what's what the objective reality happens to be i think that's well said i mean uh i've i've, I've articulated something very similar at length and uh it looks like uh um the blind spot is articulating something very similar what they claim that is lacking is of course the other perspectives, especially in our attempts to get knowledge about reality. Mm -hmm. Great. So, so that's a so again that that's important. It's a very functional thing. It's very critical. It's nice. Like you and I can both. You know, I say, hey, I think there's a fire over there. You look. You say, yeah, I think there's a fire over there. So now we've been able to use multiple different perspectives to increase our mutual confidence that our perception is an accurate perception of objective reality. Emphasis on O and R there, objective reality. And then we can make more effective decisions in our ability to navigate said objective reality. Of course, by contrast, if I say, hey, I think a Tyrannosaurus is coming at us, and you look at me like, mm, there's no Tyrannosaurus, then, well, one of us is going to survive. <laughs> one of us is going to be, be doing something rather foolish. Um, or, or ideally, I'll go, oh, yeah, you're right. That's actually a tree, and I'm just scared. Um, okay. So the question then is this other disposition, like the first person disposition and what it means to be in a culture where the third person has been so pervasive in the way that we are in relationship with reality that we have become obligate third person and in fact so obligate that we simulate first person through the third person and this you say a little bit more about that yeah yeah, yeah i'm going to delve into that Okay. Notice, of course, I'm, I'm making this all up in real time, but, but you know, this is what I do. This is what we do. So we're going to be there. We're working together. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, I'm keep going. This is great. Yeah. So let's see, how do we do that? Well, could I say something uh, that might provoke? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. 
so I mean, one way I would respond to that is I think um, I think the West actually careens between a first person and a third person perspective um, because Descartes actually gave us these two different notions of real. He gave us objective reality and subjective reality, where objective reality is the mathematically measurable, and math is the determining way in which we understand knowledge and science, and that's how it differs from Aristotelian science, for example. And But he also gave us the cogito, which is this moment of pure, where consciousness purely touches itself, is ultimately most real. And of course, our culture swings between those. We swing from an between an empiricism that says, I have to just read things objectively off the world, and a romanticism that says, no, I must express myself onto the blank canvas of the world. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so I, I think the issue is um, that what we have is a is a structurally unstable grammar, cultural cognitive grammar of realness that messes up our phenomenology around it. That's yeah. how I would put it. Yeah. So what, what now, is gonna, that helpful? Is yeah. that helpful? Yeah, really nice. So what I'm going to say is that, yeah, let's see if we can tease, if we can tease this apart, it's going to be good. Or if I can tease it apart with you. If not, it's going to be up to you. Let's see. <laughs> um, all right. So I think Descartes played a fast one. And I don't think he, he intended to, but he did. No. And this goes to that same notion of the layers of worldview. So both the romantic and the empirical are both simulations in the sense that I'm talking about. Mm, okay. Both ultimately import a subordination of a fully integrated, which is to say a true first person experience. A true first person experience does not have this separation. The separation happens in an analytical frame that, in, that is actually filtering first person experience through a mental simulation and then gives it back to itself. Right, so this is this is the trouble that the West is in, is that we have a default analytic epistemology, or actually we have a default analytic onto epistemology, which then provides us with a simulation of an integrated self at the subjective level. This is the, you know, the Buddhist thing goes here too, right? If you go to the East, the East sees the same problem. Right? The problem of actually going and quieting the monkey mind is that the monkey mind interposes itself between self and reality and then presents itself as reality. It's a simulation. It's a simulation. So, so let, let me see if I can concretize this and I won't go off into theory. I just want to concretize yeah. this. So, so one of the most powerful experiences people can have that seems to be an enhancement of their agency and in, 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 in some sense is embodied first person perspective is the flow state. But the flow state is exactly the state at which one feels radically at one. And the flow state is the state in which the nattering monkey mind narrative kind of ego thing has dropped away. And you realize that it has been lying to you when it, when it tells you that it is identical with the locus of your agency. That's right. Is that, is that, is that a totally, helpful? Totally, totally, exactly. Yeah. And notice the yeah. distinction between when the monkey mind makes these chattering noises around authenticity and when you're in fact actually in a flow state where that's not even a thing that you're considering because that's not your relationship with reality, right? right. That's the okay. key, right? So yeah. I'm, what I'm focusing on is actually the simulator that we're running and the simulator imposes itself between us and reality. And the simulator is an imposed intrinsic third person, but produce, provides us with a first person simulation, which of course is at the meaning crisis level is why we have existential angst, because it's not really us. And the more we are obligate uh, routed through that, or the more we bullshit ourselves at more finer and finer grained levels, the more angst we feel because we can't actually, this is uh, uh, Greg Henriquez, we, we want to be seen for who we are. We can't even see ourselves for who we are. And we're increasingly simulating ourselves to other people. And this is the adolescent problem of you adopt a persona. And so we're getting further and further away from our ability to be seen for who we are. Yeah. Now, this is obviously not a Western problem. Um, this is a, a human problem, but the it's a perennial problem. The West has has kind of doubled down on the superpower of what happens when you exercise that functionality, and has built a whole bunch of mechanisms, like those notions of, of dialogue. We can form trade relations. We can kind of solve our existential angst by being able to benefit from the boy. There's a lot of stuff, meta crisis stuff dropping in here. Pretty yeah, 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 yeah. Into it. Yeah. 
um, you know, I feel anxious. So what do I do? I'll, I'll, I'll make more money. Well, how do I make more money? Well, I actually optimize my persona to play in the systems of justification, which is to say the socioeconomic regime. So I can make better trade relations and become more Ricardian in my particular persona. So now I'm a executive vice president of marketing, which is not who I am vaguely, but it's a version of me that makes a lot more money. So I can buy fancier cars and slightly feel better about the trade off that I've made for some amount of time before it catastrophically collapses. And I go sit with either you or Jordan Peterson in a clinical setting or Greg, all three of you. <laughs> How funny is that? That's interesting. That makes sense. Um, okay. So that's the diagnosis. It's not even a critique. It's a diagnosis and attached to that. Oh, go ahead. Well, I wanted to add one, one thing, which we also inherited from Descartes, and I think it exacerbates this. And this goes, of course, to a lot of my work and especially the ongoing discussions I have with uh, Rafe Kelly, who is also making his way towards Christianity, as you know. Um, he, he told me I'm uh, the gateway drug. I think I mentioned that to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. uh, so, um, but this is the idea, and this is from Marlo Ponti, that, um, right, the body is right. The body is what gives us this, this, the chiasm, that which is subjective and objective, because, but is actually neither the lived body, because, right, there's the, there, there's the sort of, I'm using these very scare quoted. There's the inside of my body, which is not, I'm not talking about the physicality. I'm talking about, right. But my body is also there in the objective world as right. an object among objects, and and therefore it weaves, and it is deeper than I've coined the term transjective. And when Descartes moved us into Cartesian dualism and makes the mind something that is intrinsically disembodied by its very nature, this exacerbates, I think, the machine you're talking about, this simulator, um, and, and the way it's interposing itself. Yes, exactly. Um, between, exactly. Because, I mean, what happens in Descartes, of course, is that minds become incapable, and I mean philosophically, un ontologically incapable of contact with bodies or with other minds. And everything, everything is just the mind somehow trying to simulate to itself what the body and the world is. And then, there, of course, like you said, recursively simulating to itself what it must be such that it is engaged in these simulations. And you can get into a, understanding a lot of epistemology that way. Does that land well for you as yeah. a proposal? Yeah, exactly. And so the, the, the diagnosis then is that um, to, to properly resituate ourselves so that this full of intrinsically whole self, not a, not a analytically, synthetically reintegrated self, but intrinsically whole self, is in the McGill-Gristian Mil sense, that's hard to yes. say, uh, yes. is put back on the throne and, and the emissary is given his proper place as the emissary. Right? So that's it's sort of, that's, we, we, these things are not novel. Like this world has been talking about this kind of stuff a lot. That is just sort of re-articulating in those frames the, the argument that, I've, that I'm making in, in relationship to Christianity, specifically religion more broadly, and the scientific enterprise. So, so far, I find it, this uh, uh, very helpful. I like this notion of the whole self. This was sort of Tillich's notion of what the spirit is. Uh, the spirit is when, um, uh, to use a phrase I've been trying to, uh, when we involve the whole of the self without becoming self-involved, mm -hmm. because we're involving the whole of the self in a way that understands it to be primarily relational in nature rather than substantial in nature. Uh, and that's what, and that's why spirit is something that is more properly between people. Um, I, I've been told that the verse in the gospel is that the kingdom, it's not that the kingdom of God is within you, but the kingdom of God is among us or between us or, or within us collectively, not in, within us sort of, um, individually, although it could also mean both. Uh, so, and I'm not an expert of, uh, uh, of, of biblical Greek. So right. uh, I'll just, yeah. I'll just leave that op option. Uh, I mean, it, it's in, it's definitely in the Gospel of Thomas where he said the kingdom of heaven is, you know, spread amongst you, but you do not yet see it. Um, so I, I, I think all of this is very well placed. And this idea of the whole of the self trying thereby having a capacity to come more properly into a relationship towards the whole of reality, it can't grasp the whole of reality. Now, I take it that 
what something I just introduced a few minutes ago, uh, this notion of the self ultimately being relational in nature um, is also part and parcel. Because if we agree, as we seem to, that reality is ultimately at base, ultimately pure relationality, then if we are going to participate with the whole of ourself, our self has to be some kind of relation uh, in, in, in its intrinsic nature. Kierkegaard's uh, the self is a relation that relates to itself and, and, and that kind of thing. Is that a fair uh, uh, proposal? Yes, very much so. Yeah, and I think it's, uh, we've, we've kind of, we brought this up a little bit last time and it's worth yeah. emphasizing um, because it's, it's in many ways a tough pill to swallow if you've taken a default substance ontology approach to things. It's a little bit mind bending. And I think as I even mentioned a call with you a little while back, it's fundamental. Like one, if you get it, once you get it, it everything else begins to pivot around that. And two, yes. if we don't get it and then begin to use that as our way of re crafting relationships in general, or relationships with the world, we can't solve the meta crisis. I have been beginning to make an argument, especially for sort of a Zen, the Zen current of Buddhism, then this is what an Atman means. It, it doesn't mean that you're selfless, mm. and that there is no referent for the word self, but the self is not a substantial entity, but an inherently relational entity, which fits very well with, you know, the, the idea of codependent code arising, um, uh, Thich Nhat Hanh's notion of interbeing and, and things like that. That's um, super hardcore. Think, that feels, that feels really uh, sharp. Um, and maybe even that notion of like so much of the Zen work is precisely about dealing with this object, this simulator. And we say, okay, well, we're, well, when you say selfless, what you mean is that thing, that thing goes away, which doesn't mean that you, you're, you don't go away, but you were never a substance. That wasn't who you are. Yes. That's very nice. That's really nice. It's actually, then it take, it brings the, the intrinsic wholeness into the foreground by getting out of the way, the simulator that's been running. Mm -hmm. Nice. So you can see the possibilities for a, a sort of like I've been talking about a Zen Neoplatonism where these two things are talking very deeply uh, to each other in a dialogical, dialogos fashion. Um, so, so that that brings up something interesting. Um, so there's a sense in which there are dimensions of reality that will be disclosed in this whole self towards whole of reality that cannot properly be grasped by the scientific worldview, but are ultimately must be presupposed by it because I would put it to you that the relationality to disclose, but by the whole self to the whole of reality is precisely the, you know, the ground of intelligibility itself, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the very possibility of connectedness, the very possibility of there being something other than a random scattering of nothingness or something. I don't know what to say. Even particles will have some sort of logos to them, right? Uh, but I, I, you know what I'm trying to get at. I, and now the thing for me is I still find this deeply consistent with what you might call the boundaries of the scientific worldview. I think if you deep, if when you dig down into the quantum, you hit pure relationality. And if you, if you, if you sort of build up to the relativistic, you hit pure relationality as what is being emphasized as the grounding of reality. And so th this, this comes, this is where there might be a difference between us, but I'd like to explore it. Um, I understand the supernatural as the proposal that that which is disclosed beyond the scientific worldview is in important ways inconsistent with it, is other than it, works according to different uh, oh. principles than it. Whereas there is a notion of the supranatural, which is found in things like, I think, versions of Neoplatonism, very much in Zen, where it's no, 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 this more it has a, a, a profound identity relationship uh, to uh, the truths that are found within the scientific worldview, but it is not reducible to them. It is more real than them. It is presupposed by the scientific worldview. And that's what we're trying to get at with extended naturalism and transcendent naturalism. Uh, and I, I have, as you know, I have an ongoing critique of supernaturalism. Uh, and uh, because I think 
it, it, it just hits tremendous burden of proof arguments. Uh, I won't give the whole argument, but the, the, the main gist of it is, which is kind of a riff from David Hume, who, uh, who I will only take uh, upon cautiously, but right. Uh, uh, but the idea, like the burden of proof is to show you, show me why all of the arguments and evidence and all of the powerful record of self-correction that has gone into scientific claims can be put aside in terms of something that is inconsistent with all of that. Um, and I find that, I find that problematic. And I, and I, I don't mean just epistemological. I find it disrespectful. I just dis, find it disrespectful to the people who have sunk time and talent and often their lives and frequently sacrificed themselves uh, to make this possible for us. And I think it is a disservice and a kind of profound disloyalty to say, well, you know what? Nah. And um, I, I, I'm very, very hesitant to do that. So I wonder if that lands for you or if not, or if you want to push back. And I'm here to listen if you want to. Well, I think there's going to be a little bit of uh, what I was noting is like reconciliation. There's going to be reconciliation. Ah, good, 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 good. Uh, I, do, I do want to open you up to the possibility of challenging what I'm saying, of course. Well, uh, I, I, I will be challenging it, but I'll challenge it yeah. in a way that is actually, I think, orienting it towards the thing that is the higher version of it. Why else? Why else would I do anything? <laughs> That's a well. I mean, I mean, when Dialogus is working best, it's like how love works. What we're doing is we're trying to call each other to our best, and not only me calling you to my, your best and you calling me to our, but us calling ah our us to our best right. together. Yeah, exactly. I agree. So let me let me lay down. Let's see. Okay, I think three things. What's the right? The thing? reason I'm bringing this up is both very, both very personal for me. And it, it has, and uh, uh, there's three, and it has to do with the meaning crisis. But the other is, I, I think there's a way in which if you could address this um, with, you know, with, with the care that you're, uh, and the, well, this goes without saying, with the authenticity that you're bringing to it, I think this would alleviate some of the concerns that people are directing towards you, if they could get a good <laughs> no. answer to the decision. <laughs> so, so, uh, I, I, I hope you take this as an act of friendship. I'm trying to help you in, in, in that way. And I don't, I don't mean it in a condescending way. I mean it genuinely. All right. So, um, all right. I think, I think I'm going to try it in one order. I think it's okay. I just need to remember not to lose the last one because the last one's a little bit more, uh, well, you'll get it. So the first one, in terms of super supra, what I want to do is I want to lay out something like a, 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 an order. You, it's it's going to have a, a kinship with your order of uh, uh, participatory up to propositional. There's, there's sure. Sure. a connection. Sure. Right? Yeah. So love, hope, faith, understanding, communication. So there's a, from my point of view, it's a layer cake. And in this case, it's a layer cake with a, like a layer cake. The bottom layer is bigger than the, than the, than the layers. Okay. Yeah. We share that. Then we share that model. Okay. Um, and. The category of faith. Did we talk about that last time? Like the version? We talked a lot about it. Okay. We talked great. a lot about it. Yeah. I've been talking a lot about it in general because I'm spending a lot of time chewing on it because I think that's a key pivot point that really helps resolve a lot of issues. And so the way that I would say it is so, for example, I'm not going to carry the burden of proof you propose because I don't believe that. So I'm going to tell you what I think is right. <laughs> and maybe, right. maybe it works out. Maybe it res resolves nicely. Um, for the most part, the totality of the scientific enterprise you know, lives in this layer between faith, understanding, and communication. And that there are, are elements of reality that are not, none of this is controversial, which is why it's so, so weird there's a conflict about it. There are elements of reality that are outside of the scope of the kinds of things that are subject to the techniques of scientific investigation. Yep. Totally with you on that. Yeah. Those elements are important. <laughs> they, yeah. they, 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 they might be the kinds of things that are not subject to uh, sensory measurement, or they may, may not be subject to repeatable sensory measurement, or they may be more fundamental, like you said, intelligibility. It's actually at a category at a deeper level. Intelligibility lives at the level of faith, which is the substrate for understanding, where it allows understanding to be available at all, and therefore is not subject to the techniques of understanding. And so we're partitioning reality into its elements. Okay. So that's, that's what I think. That's how I think it works. Sounds like it's how you think it works. So now we have to sort of tease apart. Why did the siblings get into a scuffle? Um, and I think I understand. Well, 
I under, oh, okay. I understand. Okay. Let me, uh, yeah, you do use, and then I'll, I'll, I'll see what you have to say. And then I have an answer to that question. And, uh, but I want to hear yours first, and then we'll, we'll, we'll put them into uh, a relationship with each other. Yeah. So a while back, I wrote an essay. Obviously, you know, this is probably true for you as well. Most of the time when I'm writing an essay, I'm trying to make things clear to myself. So I was trying to clarify the distinctions between science, technology, religion, spirituality. There are others, but those are the ones that were in there. And one of the things that I proposed is that each of these is particular. Each has a proper domain of application. And, and, then, and then the right way to live is to bring them into relationship in their proper domain of application. But that different cultures will oftentimes find themselves over indexing on one or others. And then we'll have, we'll make it the cardinal error, which I, I invoked the, uh, the, the canonical work of the, of Ghostbusters, but I talked about is crossing the streams. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I remember. Okay. The canonical in, work. In the, in the medieval period, religion ended up trying to do too much science. So it tried to, it overstepped its bounds. And it ended up creating, when religion tries to use religion to do science, it oftentimes produces superstition or myth. That's one of the things that happens. Um, and then in the modern era, in, in an adjustment space for, for economic and political um, and military, like lots of reasons, uh, science and in, in, in its, in its sort of partner, actually kind of its boss, technology, was able to take advantage of that overstepping at, a, at the level of the, how do you call it, the egregore or the, the identity of, of the West in particular, and took that territory back. But in the act of taking the territory back, it ended up casting religion, and very specifically the religious institutions, as, a, as an adversary. And so what ended up happening is that then it overstepped its boundaries and endeavored to do religion using science. And by the way, also try to do spirituality as science. And so that also crosses the streams. And so we've now been locked in this conflict where um, both parties, I mean, it's just like what's going on in politics. Like, why is it that we end up with Trump and Biden as the, as the uh, candidates? Like the, the version of religion and the version of science that we end up seeing out there in the world are like the the uh, the equivalent of Trump and Biden. Like there's a polarization <laughs> that has to happen when the primary locus is the conflict between the two, competing for hearts and minds in a field of debate, in a field of conflict, not a field of dialogos. And right. so, um, and so we find ourselves in, in that circumstance. We find ourselves in a circumstance where religion, the, in, at the heart of religion, feels deeply um, disrespected deeply abused and reasonably so by science and scientists and the new atheists and the sort of, and, and going all the way back, like the Scopes monkey trial, think about the way that the religious were characterized in what was actually a political conflict, a socio-political conflict for wresting control over the zeitgeist of a moment and, and therefore the resources and whatnot, right? Think about that as a cultural war thing. Yeah, that's probably the right way to put it because we live so deeply immersed in culture war right now. My diagnosis is Culture war. That's what happened. Um, and we're living, we're near the end of it. We're sort of living post that. But the version of science that we see from the point of view of religion is seen as um, claiming much more certainty than it could have all the time. And we can point to like the nutrition pyramid, <laughs> you know, all these circumstances where significant political forces are imposed on people on the basis of science that follow the science. And people are abused by that over enough generations that they're like, hey, fuck you. That's where it gets sticky, right? When the energy goes to fuck you, then mm -hmm. they fire it back. I mean, you see this happening in social media across the political boundaries. People aren't civil anymore. That lack of civility goes one way. And of course, the scientists feel you know, lack of civility has felt like lack of civility, right? So they feel impeached from the other direction. And I think both of us, it's interesting, actually, because both of us straddle those worlds. Um, and I And I have spent... A, really good amount of my life in relationship with some of the most brilliant scientists in the world. And I appreciate them, right? I appreciate the curiosity. I appreciate the rigor. I appreciate what they've brought into the world. I use it routinely, like a lot. In fact, I even thought of myself as moving in the direction of being a scientist, or at least an amateur scientist. Um, and I think I still kind of do, to be honest. So therefore, at a heart level, I don't feel a sense of hurt. I feel almost like a sense of 
how do we reconcile the family members? These are family members and the family is in, in a you know, brother versus brother or divorce, even worse, like divorce style conflict. It's gotten ugly out there. So that's my diagnosis. Thank you for watching. This YouTube and podcast series is by the Verveke Foundation, which in addition to supporting my work, also offers courses, practices, workshops, and other projects dedicated to responding to the meaning crisis. If you would like to support this work, please consider joining our Patreon. You can find the link in the show notes. I, I don't have any disagreement with that. Um, I do, um, I, I, I think, so what I want to say then, I think is more amplification. I think that part of this is also, we see even before the emergence of science, we see the emergence of a drift towards propositional tyranny within the religious framework. And I've, I've made that argument extensively. Um, and there's ways in which uh, the sort of scriptura of Protestantism, which has other reasons for it. I'm not saying this is, but one of the, I think, non-deniable effects is it, it ramped up the propositional tyranny in powerful ways. Um, so um, I think that, it is going on before. Um, and I think what happens is attendant to that, maybe entailed by that, is the idea that everything is captured by belief, where belief doesn't mean to give your heart, like we talked about last time, it means to assert the truth of particular propositions and the logical relations between them. Um, and then I think both of those misrepresent each side. I think understanding faith as belief is inadequate um, in many of the ways we articulated last time. Um, I think trying to understand what science does as just the propositional manipulation of belief is wrong for all kinds of reasons. And you, you know, you were talking about there's paradigmatic reasons from Kuhn, and there's all the way down to the important role that procedural and perspectival and participatory knowing are playing essential science. And a lot of the history and philosophy of science, which I have a tremendous amount of respect for, has been putting this out and also just radically undermining the Cartesian reduction of, of logos to logic. Um, and I think a lot of the people who talk, think they talk, they're talking on behalf of science are actually not well versed in this history and philosophy of science. And what they actually do is they engage in a profound performative contradiction in which they speak about science unscientifically, which is um, kind of an irony to behold, and um, uh, but not a welcome irony, not a Kierkegaardian irony. And so I think this, I think this straitjacket has straitjacketed both of them into uh, a stance in which they have both reduced themselves to belief systems, uh, each one claiming it has the right way in which we get our belief systems, and therefore they are inherently competing in a zero-sum game. That's how I would amplify what you said. Uh, amen. I completely agree. And so we now, now we actually get to be a little bit, hmm, that's interesting. So there's a bunch of stuff that's going on as to how that came to be. Well, I want to do one thing in the amplification, then, okay. um, which is when I talk about being consistent, I don't just mean propositional consistency. I mean not falling into what's called performative contradiction. I mean, right? I, I mean, I mean a much more profound notion of integrity mm -hmm. between yeah. the kinds of knowing, uh, right? I don't just mean. I, I'm not excluding, but you know. I know you know that I, we know both enough about algorithms and the combinatorial explosion. And you, you can't you can't try and build all of your integrity off of logical consistency or coherency because you're going to hit combinatorial explosion, Godelian problems, bias variance trade offs, blah 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 blah. So what what we have to do is we have to look for well. We also care about other kinds of con contradictions, and I've mentioned it and. Uh, I just brought one up. We get into performative contradiction matters. So when I'm talking about being consistent, I'm not. I I want people not just to hear logical consistency. I'm talking about this full person integrity kind of consistency, so that all of the kinds of knowing are aligned in the best possible mutual correction of each other. That's what I would be. And for me, if you accept Tillich's proposal that that's what we're talking about, we're talking about spiritual, right? That it's 
the whole person aligned to the whole of reality, then that project is properly a spiritual project. That kind of integrity is a spiritual integrity. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Man, I'm sorry. What I'm noticing is I understand and agree. And if, if, if I feel like if there was a way to make that understanding and agreement sort of be broadly perceived, it would be really good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, we are both endeavoring in our own ways to make it more broadly received. Uh, so let me, let me, but, let me talk about, let me throw some more things out there. Um, please, please. So now another essay, you remember the one about thinking and simulated thinking? Yes, right? I and, do. And, and I do. why? So what were, I think one of our first, one of our first discussions, I think our first one was about that. Wow. And this is where I asked you if simulated thinking was what I was talking about when I was talking about bullshit, self bullshitting. And we got into that. That was, I think, Jordan, I think that was our first conversation together, actually. Our first public conversation. Providential. Um, okay. So it's, when I was, when I was writing that and thinking about that, one of the elements that came up was why, why does that, why does that happen? Right. Cause remember simulated thinking was a double whammy. The, the idea is that there's, there's sort of habits of mind compact paradigms, right? Paradigms that are functional, useful. We can use them. They go, we can run quickly. We can iterate them to build algorithms using those kinds of things. And then this other thing, thinking, which is in relationship with the wholeness of reality and has creativity and, and nuance and subtlety and insight built into it. And then what happens is, is that when we find ourselves in a circumstance, this is back to that simulator where the habits of mind begin to present themselves as being the whole story. Um, and then get locked into a, a loop because you can't have access to the insight, then you're in simulated thinking. And right? so that's the idea. And, and the, the explanation that I got to was basically culture war at the end of the day, right? Mm -hmm. uh, when you find yourself in a milieu like debate, um, thinking is going to lose more often than win because the advantages of the quick quip or the clever turn of phrase, um, the rhetorical flourish, think, you know, Socrates, the rhetoricians, um, rhetoric exists for a reason and it resists for the reason of winning culture war battles at the very low level. Um, and it acts mostly on the habits of mind of the audience to produce effects that are limbic in nature and, and it's a weapon, right? Okay. The same thing happens at the level of, of at larger levels of society. And so if I'm endeavoring to politically control a large population and maybe use them against other populations in right. various right. places of culture, this war, yeah, yeah. I need to do that. I need to, I need to have access to that same set of techniques. And think about this. Now we're going to, I'm going to fast forward to liberalism. Um, liberalism ha is uniquely risky in dropping into simulated thinking because by its nature, this Hegelian sensibility of constantly sort of refining the paradigm into finer and finer grain elements, it, it has the ability of producing a, a habits of mind or constructs and paradigms that are a very close fit to the larger reality, but are actually ultimately at the end of the day, habits of mind or paradigms. And over here, we have to be very mindful of the fact that it's intrinsically connected to a socio-political economic context. Liberalism is successful in the world more because it produces more fancy cars and cheap electronics and more food than it is a really effective epistemological method. Right? And I'm pointing that out at a political level. Like at the end of the day, 98% of the population doesn't care about what's going on in the academic discourse. They care about the fact that they have you know, more, more fried chicken or faster cars. Um, and so liberalism combines those two, right? It actually allows us to engage in uh, ra rapid technological development. It allows us to engage in um, economic specialization and, and it simplifies trade because it breaks down wars between people on the basis of property. We're thinking about how it emerges on the substrate of the propositional bias and therefore the ideological conflicts as a, as a pseudo solution to that. And so, and I'm, I'm putting that in there historically because it's a very important part of the historical moment. Right? So we already accepted, agreed that the, the falling into propositional mania, propositional bias was a historical moment that almost sort of foredoomed us to, to a series of next stages. Once you've passed a critical point there, you're going to go down a bad slide. Liberalism emerges as a, a solution to that 
but it doesn't solve the problem. It just find it literally does the thing that it does. It finds a way to create more room and it continues to ameliorate the, cat the catastrophe at the meaning crisis level and at the meta crisis level by expanding more and more of its competence, but thereby more and more likely and more and more increasingly trapping us in the simulator. Yeah, it spreads the problem throughout the world, which is one of the, by growing, trying to grow its way out of the problem, which is how politics has often been, well, if we could just grow the GDP, by trying to grow itself out of the problem, of course, also in some ways spreads the, 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 I'm going to use it this in a Kuhnian sense. It spreads the anomalies globally, the anomalies that are at the heart of the, uh, right. the meaning crisis and the meta crisis. Right. And globally, in this sense, both sort of, uh, at one level, i.e., every country and yeah. vertically, every facet from this local, yes. basic interior of the gut biome through the individual psychology and through all relationships all the way out. Right. So exactly, exactly. And this is a, a fundamental diagnosis of the meta crisis meaning crisis overlay yep 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 and and therefore by the way now we can actually situate the previous religion science conversation say oh okay well this is actually part of a much larger phenomenon that's been going on wow we're about to move pretty quick um and that's it's not surprising that it ended up being the way that it ended up because socioeconomically people are in are deeply deeply incentivized to become simulated thinkers so that they can have some degree of legibility and even just local success in the education art, right? We all know, I don't know about you, but I certainly had, I, I booted myself from school somewhere between second and third grade. Um, but if I wanted to perform well in school, I would have to give up on thinking and optimize for simulated thinking. And then the same thing happens when you move into the working environment. And you can think about how our global society is constructed as sort of maximum cope of how do we produce a type two coherence? How do we create dialogue, not dialogos, relationality that produces something that can kind of cope, but ultimately is fundamentally unstable. Right? Ultimately, once it reaches its limits of cope, and now I'm moving with psychological language, but you can see how it cascades across all the different modalities, it will then go through a crisis, hence a meta crisis. Yeah, that's, that's very well. Okay, so there's two things I want. There's two things that were sparked by that. Um, one is the idea that one of the things that happens, you know, Durkheim has these two notions of how you bring about uh, social cohesion. One is what he calls mechanical solidarity, where you try to get all the units as much like each other as you possibly can, um, and that way they fit together mechanically. And then he has the other one, which he calls it the division of labor, uh, which is you, you you pursue a strategy of sort of living complexification um, in, in order to you make people as interdependent as as opposed to as homogenous as possible. Um, and if you can see how. One, it pushes you towards a sub substance ontology, one same thing, or pushes you to a relationality uh, kind of idea. Um, and so I, I, I want to add a third. Okay, which is? Yeah, so we used the triad that we did in the beginning. Um, so the first is like the coherence of a laser, sameness. The second is relationality on a flat plane. So I'll just call that coordination or type two coherence, which is a very esoteric way of describing it. We're proposing a third, which is like the spiritual, but it's actually yes, a, yes, a that's where we're moving. A multiplicity that actually integrates in communion into a novel identity that does not subsume the multiplicity into a new sameness, that maintains and even enhances their multiplicity, but it literally increases the world by adding a new dimensionality to it. Exactly. So you you ran with that really well, and then that one that maps me into, carries me into, conveys me into the the. Now there's a question. I, I, I th there's this issue, and I've been my good friend Dan Schiappi and I we're, we're going really deeply right now. We're doing going through Hegel, but we're we're writing a book on uh, the being of rationality and the rationality of being. What does rationality look from the being mode? And how is what 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 must being be like such that that rationality can conform to it or come to know it? Um, and along the way, we we keep bumping into this this interpenetration of indeterminacy and intelligibility. It's in Fuller's work, for example, right? Um, and then phenomenologically, I've been talking about we seem to have these two different senses of realness 
And I have a suspicion that the Descartes thing might have sort of pivoted on them, but also simulated them rather than living in them. So one is our sense of realness as, well, you know, the gathering together, the logos, the confirming, the coming together, things fitting together, working together, belonging together, notions of coherence and correspondence and consistency. And so you know what I'm pointing. But we also have this notion, no, but reality is that which takes us by surprise when the experiment shows us that our hypothesis was false. And there's the notion of, and of course, you that's indeterminate because it precisely falls outside of yes, okay. your projected. And, and what you, you have is you have these two senses of realness, right? Which is the conf, the if yes. this either the confirmation and surprise. And you know, part of what we're trying to do is try to understand ratio as the project of realizing them in a po an opponent processing that gives you a kind of optimal op. Uh, uh, sorry, fundamental optimal grip on reality. Can you actually? And then let me. And, and I'm going to get into what the, uh, one of our topics here, which is, and the way that's enacted is by Plato's proposal that our fundamental project is to hold in tonos our finitude and our transcendence. And the finitude is this, the determinate, the grounded, the, the coming together. And the transcendent is that which about reality, which continually surprises us. And of course, if we identify with one, we become hubristic monsters. And if we identify with the other, we become uh, servile, humiliated despairers. Um, and then this, of course, is my way of proposing that and also bringing up the topic of humility oh, as a virtue. Right. Because I think virtue, the virtue of humility is exactly that virtue. If we, if we build reverence into what we mean by virtue of holding on, not, not holding on, wrong word, participating in finitude uh, by appreciating the confirmation sense of realness and participating in the transcendent by appreciating the transcendent aspect of realness, holding those together and remembering that I am properly a human being when I, I'm always mutually recognizing and inhabiting the tonos between finitude and transcendence. And that is humility. I want to, that, that's what that virtue is doing there. Okay. Good. <laughs> we can move on. <laughs> um, let's see. Yeah. So, I mean, what I'm about to say is obvious, but I just want, felt like it was, might be nice to put in there. It's just to say, look, this notion of the relationship and the relata, you know, we're saying that reality is the relationship and the, uh, the, the determinate and the surprising are the relata and that reality is, is the relationship. Right? So it's more, it's a more yeah. fundamental thing that holds these two. And, yes, and, yeah. and our life needs to be in that thing. We are relationality. Our life at it, the tonos is, is what the quality, how do we, how do we, how do we live in that way? And right? how do we live? Yeah. That's the question. Yeah. That's the inquiry. Um, and how do we, and how do we live both? Uh, how do we say this right? Um, yeah. With this notion of the, the vertical, the increasing of the dimensionality. So how do we live more in that way? Dialogos. How does, how does Jordan as a, as a, as a, as a relational identity, cultivate a tonos, a harmonic tonos with John as a relational identity, so as to give rise to a new relational identity that has even a richer and more potent and subtle and therefore more beautiful capacity for being navigating this tonos, right? That's like that set of three. Yeah. That's what's up. Yeah. 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 I, I totally, I totally agree with that. I totally agree with that. And for me, humiliation, uh, it, when we make it as something distinct from humility, is to fall into the attractor well of just the pole of finitude and despair. Where, uh, and hubris is to fall or be sucked into. I don't know which is the right word here. I'm thinking of Scylla and Charybdis here, right? It's to get sucked into uh, um, the opposite pole of, of inflation. And, and then I put it to you. That this maps on to the thing, two things in our culture, which of course are nihilism, which is the finitude attractor, and narcissism, which is the hubristic. 
attracted. Another way of understanding the meaning crisis is that those are prevalent precisely because the polarity of our humanity has been lost. Yeah. Yeah. So let me do the same polarity in one that you're quite familiar with, but I'm increasingly familiar with, which and it, I think it maps, which is over on this side, we have the uh, salvation of, of works. And here I mean at the Pharisaic level, right? we follow a very large number of rules super well, and you guys are shitty. Therefore, we're saved. Now, that one, that which is, of course, is narcissism. And, and then over here, we have the, um, the, the, the notion of the perception of unearned grace that grounds itself in a self, I mean, self flagellating, self debasing, right? I am so unbelievably terrible that the notion that I could deserve grace is like impossible. Self mortification. Self mortification. Yeah, yeah, nice. And so the, and you know, the, the tonos that lives in the middle that I was literally talking about with a friend today just before this call. Oh, you're proposing Christianity is a middle path between these yeah, two. Yeah. Very much. Yeah, yes. Right. And, and let's do it. We can do it in two steps. It's actually very easy. So the first, because you and I are both parents, in fact, we're both fathers. And so, and we both love our children, which is a, a, yes. a convenient, yeah. Yeah. A convenient thing for a father to have. Um, sadly, not a universal thing. Um, so as, as a, as a parent or as a loving parent, you, you have this thing where you know that you see your child. You see them and you love them because you see them. And what they do isn't relevant. And that's the key, right? They can't do things to earn your love, not because you don't enjoy the things they do, but it's because it's not how it works. It's, it's because yeah, that's them, right. That's right? right. You're just like, I see you. Yeah. And so therefore what you do delights me. I am delighted. And when you do things that are a fulfillment of who you are, it delights me greatly. And when you do things that are destructive to who you are, it pains, pains me greatly, right? And not because I'm angry at you or because they make me mad, but rather because I love you, because I see you. And I, and I feel out of that love for you, I feel deeply called to find a way to support you in walking the path towards who you are, because it's so beautiful. It's so glorious to perceive that. And all you do is flip that. Just flip that one step. Say, okay, that is the proposition of what Christianity says is God's relationship with us. That is that exact relationship. So, so let me, this is a Whiteheadian question uh, within that framework, and I like it. Uh, but I'm going to use the analogy. I see my children, but I see them in a way that affords them surprising me. <gasps> yeah, because of Because if I were to see them in a way uh... and see, and Part of the one of the conceptions of God is God is um like I'm not trying to get into an argument about doctrine. I'm trying to get into phenomenology. You can con and Nietzsche gave voice to this. You can conceive of God as an overwhelming viewer that sees you to such an extent that you are robbed of any capacity for being who you are. Um, that kind of and you can see at at least. Uh, some of Luther's early writings seem to have that mm -hmm. uh, sense yeah. that, 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 right? That God's looking at me is crushing, um, it ca causes despair. And so Whitehead was, was proposing God more as he called it the fellow traveler or the, po the, or the poet of the universe, the way a poet writes a poem. This proposal, it's a Whiteheadian. It was actually picked up by one of his followers, uh, uh, Faber, who's doing a lot of, who's written maybe the book on Whitehead right now, The Mind of Whitehead, which is like this vast... It's, not a it's Whiteheadian, right? You can't write anything about Whitehead. It isn't 700 pages. Well, there are some small books, but yeah, I get the point. Um, uh, then, and he's also got um, a book something uh, along the titles of uh, Depths, Depths Yet Unspoken, where he's trying to get in the mystical uh, dimensions that are often not properly foregrounded when People are talking about Whitehead. Anyways, he proposes and he picks up on one of Whitehead's metaphor and tries to make, craft uh, a theology out of it. When I think well, reasonably well, which is this notion of God as the poet of reality, as opposed to the, you know, the carpenter of reality, that the poet is seeing things very clearly. In fact, that is what makes a great poet a great poet. The poet is seeing things, but that doesn't mean the poet 
is writing the poem and not also listening to the surprising emergence that's coming out of the poem as they're making the poem, right? And I, I, for me, that of course is a feature of the logos when I, when I'm writing and that is taking place or when I'm writing poetry and that takes place. Uh, that's very much when you, the muse, the muse and the musicality show up. And so, did, does that transfer back to the analogy from the, because I think a good parent is a poet of their child, not a carpenter of their child, right? Yeah, I, 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 I can't help but agree, right? So I feel, I feel that same reality. And, you know, as, the, as I've been sort of delving into scripture and working backwards from there, frankly, I keep seeing this show up. Right? We see plenty of examples where God's heart is broken by the choices that people make. And it doesn't seem to be performative, like he's not pretending, it really is real. And so that implies that, one, it could have been otherwise, and two, in some sense, he was surprised, and in fact, in this case, disappointed. Um, in my mind, I, I've been able to craft a, a way of, uh, you're going to laugh at this in a second, but for me, it's the Dungeon Master version, not the poet. <laughs> ah, oh, yeah, 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 uh, yeah. In fact, I'll do it. You know, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll, I'll lay it out. Right. So, but in my mind, as I've gone through and, and checked scripture against this model, it, it doesn't throw any errors. Like it's a, it fits the, the, the story, all, all the various characteristics. So it works like this. So over here, I have, let's just go with like Harry Potter as written by J.K. Rowling. And so in this category, Harry Potter, Hermione, they are people like say David or Peter. Um, and J.K. Rowling is playing the role of God, the creator. She creates the world. Now, in that world, it's not really realistic to think that J.K. Rowling is going to be truly, deeply surprised by Harry Potter or Hermione because they are ultimately entirely figments of her imagination. Now, interestingly, at the level of being a creator, having done this kind of thing before in the past, I have been surprised by what emerges. And that's interesting. So I'm going to hold that to the side. But certainly at the level of when it's written down, it's in the book. If I'm reading it. Um, we can say this every single, there's no notion that Harry Potter is, a, is an agent that has choice in what's going on. He's just a figment of JK Rowling's imagination. She as the author had choice, but he didn't. That's the book. If I move over over here to like a, the film version, I notice a little tiny scope of agency, not big, but a little bit, right? Cause the way the actor who is a human portrays like the tone of voice that he uses, the facial that he uses has a little bit of play. And that's part of the film environment. Like sometimes things are put into the film that were entirely spontaneous on the part of the actor. This is even more so if I move into the realm of theater, right? Because now it's every day. It's a different version. There's a, you know, more play. Okay. So in each case, what's happening is I'm moving from a, uh, an on, what I call it, a cosmology that is entirely determined by the, by the author and, and that the, the agents or the beings, the people in it are entirely, um, fictional. To one that has increasing agency sitting in the in the in the agent or the person, but of course, in all those cases, like the big arc, like how the story ends, the author wrote that down. Right? The actors aren't determining how the story ends; are, the actors are determined are just sort of have a small amount of agency inside. If I move all the way for me in my story, I'm just going to put here on the left D and D, right? and D and D is is I think beautiful because it starts to put it on on a cross, which is a good a good symbolic geometry. Um, the player characters are real humans and they have wide latitude in what they do. The DM is the world creator and holds the DM side, the ability to come and do fiat at will if necessary. And the big picture view of what's going on in the world that the, the player characters don't perceive, right? So you're seeing things through your character's eyes. You ever played D&D? Is this landing or do I need to give you an example? I, I played, I played D&D and Powers and Perils, both of them. Okay. I've also played God. I've also played Godlike, which is a, a version set somewhat like uh, like that in World War II, which is was it, I think of all three, the one I enjoyed the most playing. Wow, interesting. I've never heard of that, which is rare. <laughs> I've heard a lot of these. Um, so you get the idea, right? And so what happens is, is that the DM has the big picture, the major set pieces, the large arc, um, can at any point determine any aspect that he wants, uh, but the whole point is to make the game delightful, right? to, to make the playing of the game wonderful um, for everyone. Right? For, the whole point is to make it so that everybody continues to play. 
uh, invest more and more. Like they play more and more deeply to invite uh, the player. Uh, committed, to, committed to the meta game. Exactly. Yeah. Committed yeah. to the meta game or to the infinite game as. Uh, yeah, yeah. As Cars would, Cars would say. say yeah. yeah. And so that, that is the kind of the. the, the I, I did it in the frame of D&D just precisely to make it impossible to elevate to being a serious theology. I don't, I don't want to be a serious <laughs> theologian because I'm not. But that fits for me because, again, this notion of love requires something like that. You can't really love something that doesn't hold the possibility of delight. And you can't be delighted in something that you already are perfectly certain every aspect of it in every possible way. Well, and beauty is surprise that can be integrated, right? Um, so, yes, if you want beautiful, that's also the case. Um, and, I, I, you know, and th th this is part of the Whiteheadian view, too, that um, God um, is works through persuasion, but in the sense of dialogos rather than uh, dictation. It's this idea um, uh, that we come close to understanding how this poesis works when we're in deep dialogos, in which we are fully participating, but we're not commanding or, carp or being carpenters. And the logos is guiding, but it's not dictating. Um, and you get that sense. And for me, that's the metaphor I use to try and understand what is being proposed uh, here. Well, and of I course, think, it goes I well. both. I mean, both are true. And there's, there's, yeah. There are yeah. aspects of the world that we're in over which I have, I take as purely out there. There are aspects of the transcendent subjective and aspects of the objective that are guiding, like they're carpentry. <laughs> they're just out there. And I don't have any particular influence over the law of gravity. It's, it is what it is. Um, oh, I didn't. I didn't mean that. No, but what I mean is that like, if we say God is both, yeah. then okay, that seems to make sense. Like God is creating a, a, an arena for us to play in, and then is playing with us in that arena. And the playing part has this characteristic of dialogos. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, uh, yeah, that's um, yeah. Whitehead, uh, his notion of ultimate reality is sort of broken. Not broken. That's the right word. Wrong word. Sorry. Um, it, it, there's what he calls the extensive continuum, which is, um, I'll use Spinoza terms, that's sort of nature as natured. And then there's God, which is nature as naturing. Um, and the two are bound together. Um, he's, Whitehead said, uh, says something along the lines that uh, God transcends the world to the same degree that the world transcends God. Uh, which is uh, a, a variation on Eckhart's, the eye by which I see God is the same eye by which he sees me uh, kind of idea. Um, um, because there's, you, you need to have a, well, I would argue, you need to have a model of reality that properly, deeply, humbly respects and appreciates its inexhaustibility. It is not a thing like your table or right, or, or even your table is inexhaustible in one level. But you know what I'm trying to do with this? There's an inexhaustibleness to the world, so to speak, right. that has to be properly situated within our ontology. And I think that responsibleness, uh, sorry, th that that inexhaustibleness is at one with the inexhaustibleness of God as the one in a Neoplatonic sense. And that one, that the, the one between those two inexhaustibilities is not a logical one uh, by any means. Right. I'm not saying that. Right. No, I get it. And I, I, this is this is right. And it's so we're in some sense rewinding back to this notion of the tonos, right? Where humility sits yes. in this location yep. where you are neither um you know, knocked to a point of despair, nor um stepping into hubris in relationship, but rather actually entering into a, a relationship of and ultimately, and this is the thing: it's it's quite it's open to all the all the things that we like. Right? It's, it's, through humility comes things like delight. Through humility comes things like surprise. You know, through humility and comes aliveness and beauty. Yes, all those things. Right? So this, these are all sort of bound in a particular location, and then that helps us situate. We can kind of get a better sense of okay, well, if it's ugly, it's not humility. Right? So just as an FYI. Well, I mean, I put it to you that this is helpful. I think a distinguishing difference between pornography and beauty is that beauty calls humility from us and pornography denies a role for humility. Oof. That, uh, right. But like that, I think is a fundamental difference. Man, that's and then that's following on Han's work, right? Whenever, whenever we come to something and it, 
and we do not feel we should enter into, we should be exercising the the virtue of humility, then we're getting into a pornographic relationship uh, to it. And whereas if we come to something, even uh, for me, a naked woman, that doesn't have to be pornographic if I can come into it. Um, I, I, I'm not talking about coming into an object, which is, I'm talking about coming into a relationship with a person, right? Mm -hmm. that, that is, um, you know, that, that is, can be experienced that same reality can be experienced as beauty because I come to it with humility um, rather than with um, a, a, a bullshitting in which I try to pretend that humility is not relevant in this situation. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a, uh, what's that, what, what is that there? So in this case, humility, certain characteristics of humility are associated with, um, well, they're part and parcel of the, of the notion of repentance, but I'm specifically focusing on the ori. Ah, there we go. Yeah. Orienting the, the way that we are making our governing our relationality. There we go. Or orienting the way that we're governing our relationality. Like where, where are we sourcing? Where are we sourcing the, the basis by which we are going to ultimately cho choose what relation qualities of relationship are we going to be entering into? Yeah. Right. And, and, and pornography is humiliating rather than something done with humility because it is the attempt to make the other completely accessible and consumable to me and put them forever beyond the capacity for surprising me. They become what Han calls the smooth. And the reason I want to do this is because I'm trying to use something and I'm, I'm picking something that's provocative and I'm trying to be, I hopefully, helpfully provocative. I think the naked body can be beautiful or, or pornographic. And the reason why I want to say this is because there were, there have been errors within Neoplatonism and Christianity to my mind of identi identifying the body per se as something ugly or something that should be, right, uh, uh suspected. Um, uh, and I think, and one of the things that drove the Renaissance was an attempt way before the Reformation or the uh, Scientific Revolution, the Renaissance was trying to get back the notion, uh, no, the natural, and especially the human body, can be beautiful. It's not the body that is the issue. And you know why I'm going on to this, because we're talking about embodiment. And we have to be able to find the body beautiful in order for embodiment to really take. Right? Talk all you want about the body, and if you don't think, if you can't really understand the body as beautiful, then you're not going to be embodied, right? And so I'm trying to challenge this history, and I admit the Neoplatonism, and there are versions of Buddhism, there's versions of Hindu, there are, we have this tendency to turn on the body, and because it can be a salient object of pornography, we forget that it is also a place in which beauty can disclose itself, the beauty of embodiment. Yeah, I mean, if we sort of orient to a simplicity of the Beatitudes, we have the, the Scylla and Charybdis. You know, if, the, if the mandate is, if you look with the eye of lust, pluck your eye out, then you're like, well, I kind of can't skip, I can't get away from the lust part. So I'm going to go ahead and go with the, let's not, you better be fully clothed, right? That's the only way we're going to solve this problem. So it's like a capitulation to lack of trust and frankly, lack of repentance, like lack of actual discipleship is to say, well, wow. I'm going to take the safe, safe path here. I'm going to keep my eyes by just making it so that I don't even have the possibility of being tempted. But one might imagine, and I would be surprised if it wasn't in there somewhere, that Christ could look at a naked female body and not be tempted by lust. And that's the thing we're called towards is to be able to perceive that, the, perceive the actual beauty and to build in ourselves the capacity to actually be deeper and deeper into relationship with beauty and the possibility of beauty, which is, a, which is on us, right? It's on us. We don't want to control our world and separate ourselves from beauty so that we avoid one kind of error, thereby guaranteeing another kind of error. Like this, this, this middle way is, is a tricky business. Yeah, very, I, think that, I think that was beautifully well said. I, I think for me, the way we do that, the way we properly canal, canalize lust is, you know, in, in, in the deep, full person, spiritual commitment to another person. Um, and so that, um, that desire 
is transfigured, I'll use some Christian language here, into delight, into mutually shared delight, rather than into one-sided asymmetrical consumption. And, you know, these, these things that we see, we see all the time, I think the parenting metaphor just continues to bear fruit. Um, you know, a, a child is doing something that is bad for the child. Do you, and you, and you can't quite find your way to a, an adequate skillfulness of really supporting them into, onto the proper path well. So what do you do? You either are permissive and let them take the risk or you're controlling and you take their sovereignty, yeah, yeah. right? Okay. Yes, yes. yes. There you go. <laughs> and we see this doing that. If you look yeah. at the vices, the places where religion has made an error, well, it's made that exact same error. Right? If conservative, conservative religions tend to bias towards uh, controlling and liberal religions tend to bias towards permissiveness and neither one is good parenting. That's, a, that's very much so you're, 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 without being condescending, you're casting that religion should uh, aspire to take on a parental role uh, rather than a controlling or I don't know what the, an, an enabling role or something like that. Yeah, that's a very interesting proposal. Um, I, I, I think when I, I think of religion like the, the, the one ring in uh, in one sense, not in all senses, in the Lord of the Rings, because it just tends to magnify whoever's wearing it. And what I, I think religion um, can be something that magnifies people's worst defects. I think if you're defective and you're wielding the power of religion um, on behalf of your deficits or your excesses, um, the religion makes it much worse. Okay. But I think if you have virtues, the religion magnifies those virtues and makes them much more powerful. Um, that's how I, I so, uh, that's how I would. Yeah. So if, if you view, if you view religion from the point of view of, let's see, ideology slash substance ontology, yes. as opposed to relationality and the, the various things that are associated with how relationality properly works. And that's the key that there, there are ways to be able to support and participate a hey, dialogos, right? Dialogos is yes, something yeah, that says, yeah. hey, this is of the toolkit of relationality. This is not of the toolkit of control. Right? So that, right? Religion can be coming this way, which is the, you know, it's grasping, it's shortcut. It's ultimately subject to the simulation or propositional domination. It doesn't come from the organic aliveness of family, right? of, 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 of spirit, meaning whole, real wholeness, actual wholeness. It is the, you can see this in so many different examples, like the situation we've kind of got like the, the, the family at the family gathering that is a family that's not really in loving wholeness, but the desire to present that. And so like the, the need to kind of control it, right? So there's these two modes that we can use, but we try to create a simulation of lived wholeness through a variety of different techniques, all of which are wrong. And the proper approach is, okay, how do we re-enter back into this dialogos? How do we re-enter back into love, hope, faith, understanding in the right order? And maybe you have to go through some real work to rebuild that. You know, humility also is the thing that brings us back down the stack. It brings us back into love, all the way down to the bottom of love. Like we talked about with grief as well. Like grief brings us all, sh sheds all the other stuff until you get back down in the very bottom of grief. You actually perceive the, the infinity of love from which you can now be reclothed back up that stack. And, and able to there, thereby be more fully able to engage in the proper way, right? To 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 be in proper communion, right? To be in to be a proper liturgy. I'm using these particular words now. So, yeah, yeah. The liturgy yeah. is that there's the fabric, the tool of relationality. How do we work together to form a proper communion? Like how do we form an identity that is this emergent thing that is greater yeah. than us, and and also. But it doesn't dominate us, right? And so we have anti liturgy. It calls us. Pardon? It calls us. It calls us. Yeah, it calls yeah. us up even more, right? It nurtures us. It supports us. It makes us more beautiful. Um, and that, like those two, like that, that very simple thing is a lot of the whole story. Yeah. I, I, I agree with that. I think that's really wonderful. Um, I'm going to, again, we're going to pause where uh, there's going to be more. Um, Jordan knows that I am in, in the process of inviting somebody uh, he, he knows and who has, he's had also amazing con con via logos with and who is a beloved friend of mine, which is Christ Christopher Master Pietro. I think having Chris come in uh, for the third one of these 
uh, would be uh, a really beautiful, uh, in all the ways we've been talking about it, uh, addition to this. Because uh, um, Chris has an interesting, uh, um, he's gone through his own interesting return to Christianity in a certain way. Um, and um, um, and I am deeply uh, respectful of it. And so I want to uh, just give you, as I always do uh, with my guests, first of all, my gratitude. This caught fire. This this the, the, the logo showed up, and we were sailing, man. We were sailing, uh, and that was great. And I want to thank you for um, your good faith. I hope you found that I reciprocated it. I aspired to to respond in good faith and maintain the fire of the Dialogos, uh, cultivate it and tend to it together and attend to it together. Uh, so all of my gratitude for that. And um, but now just give you the the final word in our pause. My final word is pretty easy, which is um, I just want to thank you for your friendship. You know, it is really the case that one, we are friends. Yes, yes. <laughs> and two, yes. you've been you've done a really wonderful job of keeping that in the foreground. And I really appreciate that. Thank you for that.